Law School Changes. The LSAT, the Law School Admissions Test, is dropped as a requirement. Law in Practice. The Four Legal English Podcast is now in session. On today's docket, we look at law school changes, the LSAT exam being dropped as a requirement. Before starting the podcast, I want to share an exciting announcement. I've just started a new website. Of course, we have the fourlegalenglish.com website, but now we also have the fourbusinessenglish.com website. Now, the business English does have a hyphen, a, a dash in between. So it's for the number four, business-english.com, fourbusinessenglish.com. So, of course, for legal English focuses on legal English and lawyers, law students, etc. The for business English will focus on more business English, not so much legally related. But of course, there's a huge overlap. There are lots of terms that, that can be used in both. So, if you have friends or colleagues that may not be lawyers, but they do want to improve their business English, please share with them the new website. And of course, if you have lawyer friends, and I know that you do, please, please share with them for LegalEnglish.com. It'd be great to have some more followers and encourage them to check out the courses that we have available. All right, on to the regular podcast. Welcome to the For Legal English podcast. This is the show for lawyers, law students, and other professionals from all over the world who want to improve both their legal English and legal knowledge. In this podcast, we discuss different legal topics, such as law in the news, law in practice, legal writing, legal movies, and other issues. Disclaimer, the show does not give out legal advice. We discuss legal topics, but we are not giving out any legal advice. If you do need legal advice, of course, you should consult an attorney. I am Timothy Barrett, your host. I'm a former practicing attorney from the United States, more recently a law professor in Tbilisi, Georgia and currently an author and podcast host, among other things. Go to our website, 4 is in the number 4, legalenglish, no spaces or dashes, dot com. 4, legalenglish.com. Check out our blog articles, available courses, and the show notes for this episode. Law School Changes. The LSAT is dropped. Law in Practice. In this episode, we discuss changes in American law school admission practices. The LSAT exam may become optional, not a requirement. What does this mean? What is the LSAT? How will law schools adjust? What does that mean for people applying to law schools in the United States? Recently, the ABA decided to make the LSAT optional and no longer mandatory when applying to law schools. So why is this important? Well, the ABA, the American Bar Association, controls or at least heavily influences all law schools in the United States. Why did they make this decision? Their explanation was diversity. It is an attempt to encourage a more diverse body of law students, students from different ethnic backgrounds, in other words. Unfortunately, by doing it, it seems that they have a very low opinion of the people that they say they're trying to help. In other words, they're making the argument that certain people can't do well on the LSAT, which I'm not sure is is true. In fact, there were about 60 law school deans who objected to this and warned that such a move could actually harm the goal of diversifying the legal profession. So it's not at all clear that it will have the result that they say that they're looking for. The LSAC, which runs the LSAT exam, argues that, quote, it could lead to law schools admitting students who are unlikely to succeed despite incurring debt to attend, close quote. And certainly, if the LSAT is as advertised, that is, it tests the aptitude of a 
of an applicant, you know, how, how well are they going to do in law school, then certainly if you're going to allow people who don't do well in that exam into law school, then those people are not going to do well in law school. And if, in fact, they do do well, then maybe that means the LSAT is not the very good exam. You know, it's not doing what it says it's doing, which leads to a whole host of other questions. So let's look at some of these questions a little bit more deeply. Accreditation. In almost every country, there's some kind of accreditation process for universities or educational institutions. But in many places, it's the government itself. The government will give accreditation, which basically just means permission to run as whatever it is. In this case, we're talking about law schools. But in the U.S., it's generally independent organizations that give accreditation to universities, not necessarily the government itself. And for law schools... It is the American Bar Association, the ABA. There are currently about 200 ABA-approved law schools throughout the United States. The ABA, the American Bar Association, is basically a guild for lawyers. It's not a mandatory bar association. Let's take a step back. A state bar association would be mandatory. If you want to be a lawyer in that state, if you want to be a lawyer in New York, you have to be a member of the New York Bar. But besides those mandatory associations, there are voluntary bar associations, such as the American Bar Association. Anyone who is a licensed lawyer in the United States can join the ABA. And I believe law students can join as well. But if I remember right, you do have to be a member of the bar or a law student to join the ABA. And it is by far the largest bar association in the United States, even though I, I do believe that most lawyers are not members of the ABA, but it's still by far the, the largest bar association. Now, besides accreditation, they deal with a lot of other issues. They provide a lot of training in different areas. They have many different divisions and subdivisions that look at, at laws and provide, besides just trainings, but practice guides, other information. I know when I was operating solo, they had a lot of information, a lot of guidance and support for solo law firms. Great source of knowledge. So why is ABA approval, why is the ABA accreditation so important to law schools? Because th this is not set up by statute or anything like that, but it's just that each state bar sets requirements for a bar admission and to sit for their bar exam. So almost always you have to take the bar exam before you're admitted to the bar. But to even take the bar exam, you have to meet certain requirements. So the bar admission, the bar exam are, are two different steps, two different things. Now, every state, all 50 states, recognize that if the ABA has approved a law school, then they will recognize it, and a graduate from that ABA-approved law school will be able to sit for their bar exam. So when you're thinking about going to a law school, if you're looking at one that is ABA-approved and one that's not, that's going to be a huge difference. It doesn't mean that if a law school is not ABA approved, if they're not accredited by the ABA, that it's useless or you can't do anything with it. It just means that it's much more limited. For example, the largest market for non-ABA law schools is California, where they have several law schools that are not ABA approved. And of course, California is a huge market. And California itself is a huge state. You're looking at almost 40 million people, the number of lawyers there is almost a quarter million people, maybe 225,000 people. So that means that the California State Bar has 225,000 members or, or whatever the, the number actually is. So a lot of people in California, when they consider what law school to go to, they may be most concerned with, can I take the California Bar? In that case, it doesn't really matter if the law school is ABA approved or, or not because they know that they're not going to leave California. They know they're not going to practice law somewhere else. And there are a handful of other law schools throughout the country that, that are like that and do have accreditation from their state or maybe the neighboring states as well so that their graduates can become lawyers and become member of the bars. But they are somewhat limited. They can't just decide suddenly they're going to go to a different state. They may not be able to take the exam, may not be able to admit it into that state bar. 
And of course, when you're considering law schools, for most people, if it's not ABA approved, they're just going to kind of ignore it. They're going to strike it from their list of possible law schools. Accreditation by the ABA is huge. It is very significant. So when the ABA says this is a requirement or it's no longer a requirement, law schools are going to pay attention to that. That's going to be a, a big deal. If you're enjoying today's episode, please subscribe, give us five stars, and a quick review. Go to our website, four, as in the number four, legal English, no spaces or dashes, dot com. Four, legal English, dot com. You can check out our blog articles, available courses, and the show notes for this episode. Some of the episodes do have an online quiz, so go to the show notes and check it out. On the show notes, you can also comment. It's a great way to practice and improve your legal English skills. And if there are any questions remaining from the podcast episode, ask them there. Today, I want to talk about our new course, Business Email Writing. This course is available on the sister website, forbusiness-english.com. That's forbusiness-english.com. This business email writing course is great to help improve your email writing. Do you ever have trouble expressing yourself or need to sound more professional in your emails? Perhaps you can't explain what you need to say or what you are asking the reader, the receiver to do. Or maybe you're not getting useful replies. The replies to your emails don't answer your questions. Or maybe you're just not getting the answer that you want. This course can help. It'll teach the mechanics, kind of the fundamentals of writing emails, but also go over strategies and tips to write much more effective emails. Right now we're at a launch sale, so please check it out. That's business email writing for business-english.com or go to the show notes page and you can see a link to it there. LSAT and LSAC. We all love acronyms, right? Let's, let's get these acronym explanations out of the way. The LSAT is the Law School Admissions Test. It's an entrance exam to law schools. And up until now, it was required for admission for almost all law schools, certainly all ABA-approved law schools. The LSAC is the Law School Admission Council. This is the organization that runs the LSAT. So the LSAT is given by the LSAC. According to the LSAC, the LSAT is the only standardized test designed specifically for law school admission, and it's designed in partnership with law schools to assess the skills most needed for law school success, critical reasoning, reading comprehension, and persuasive writing. Research consistently shows that the LSAT is, is the best single predictor of law school success. When combined with undergraduate GPA, an LSAT score provides the strongest prediction of success in law school and becomes an invaluable component of a holistic admission process. Close quote. And GPA, of course, is the grade point average. So remember, in the United States, a person has to complete their undergraduate degree, their bachelor's, and then apply to law school. You can't get a Bachelor of Laws in the United States. We have another episode about that. In fact, that was our first episode. So if you want to learn more about how to become a lawyer in the U.S., check out that episode. It's a classic. So the LSAC does give the LSAT exam. So, of course, they do have a vested interest. They want the LSAT to continue and to be you know, very, very, very important. It's going to be good for them. But they also do other things. They do do more than just give the LSAT. They have a huge database of law school admission requirements and other information about law schools. So if you're planning on applying for law school, this is really like, like ground zero where to start. You can get a lot of information about the different schools and, and general advice as well. And more than that, they also help with the application. Of course, it'll send the LSAT scores, but also send other documents to the law school. So you can basically file your important documents with the LSAC 
and they will verify it and everything like that. And then they will, you know, send them on to all the schools that you apply to. So it kind of makes it a, a one-stop shop or at least for a lot of the requirements. So it does make applying easier. And of course, for cost. So if you're thinking of law schools in the United States, it's definitely a good place to compare different law schools, come up with a list, and maybe start narrowing down that list, deciding which ones you don't want to go to as well as which ones you, you'd prefer to go to. Applying to law school. So of course, it's up to each law school what they consider. And most law schools will consider, I think, kind of like three, maybe four important things. One is the GPA, the grade point average of your undergraduate degree, your bachelor's degree. Another one is the LSAT score. And these are both important because they're quantifiable. They're numbers. So you can kind of compare people from different GPAs, but even more so the LSAT. In some universities, it may be more difficult to get a high GPA than at other universities. For instance, at Harvard, I believe that most of the class graduates with honors. So that's quite an accomplishment for most of the people to be the best, in other words. So the LSAT was kind of that, that gatekeeper or leveling the playing field where everyone, no matter what school you went to or what background you, you have, you had to take the same test so you could kind of compare, or at least the the law school could compare you with other applicants. And the other things that they will consider are, of course, life experience. In the United States, it's very common that before applying to law school, you'll have a few years of actually working and doing something, have some real life experience before going back to law school. For example, when I went to law school, I had already worked a few real jobs at some financial companies, including some of the largest in the United States, as well as being a cop. You know, I was with the NYPD for a few years, and then I went on to law school. So I turned 30 while I was at law school, and that was fairly common. We had some students who, of course, went to the bachelor's, completed that, and so started law school at you know, 21, 22, maybe 23, but a lot had a few years' experience. And some might have more. You know, some might be in their late 30s or in their 40s, or you, know, you might have a couple of people maybe even in their 50s going back to law school. I'm not sure that I would recommend that, but you, know, you might see those people. It's much more common in the United States than I think in, in some countries. Another big requirement is the diversity, which you know, the law school is really to talk about ethnic diversity, not so much diversity of, of thought or anything like that. And so that can be another factor that they'll consider. Now, for those people who are applying now or, or next year, you know, I would certainly say still take the LSAT. This ABA recommendation, this ABA recommendation that they just approved is not until fall of 2025. So the LSAT is still going to be a requirement for a few more years. And even after that, the LSAT may be a good way to differentiate yourself, especially if you do well on standardized tests. It certainly is a test that you can study for and prepare. And by studying and preparing for it, you can certainly do a lot better in that test. But what are your thoughts? Do you like or dislike standardized tests? Do you do well in them or do you do or do you struggle in those types of tests? I know growing up in the United States, we get used to standardized tests. Every few years in grade school, we would always take some standardized tests. You know, we'd have it for a week or two out of the school year where you're just taking these standardized tests once a day or something like that. So you get very used to these types of, of exams. I remember one year I was in grade school, now fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and the teacher made the mistake of telling me that these tests did not matter, that they, you know, don't worry about the grade. It's not going to reflect the score in the exam. is not going to reflect on your grade. So for a couple of exams, I just did A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. <laughs> and I don't think the teacher was amused. But you take a lot of standardized tests, I think, growing up in the United States. So tell me what you think about it. Lexicon. So here are some of the lexicon words that we discussed today. A lot of them are acronyms, I'm afraid. ABA, or the American Bar Association. The LSAT, or the Law School Admissions Test. The LSAC, the Law School Admissions Council. 
We also talked about the bar exam, bar admission, accreditation, GPA, grade point average, and undergraduate, meaning bachelor's degree. What questions do you have about today's episode? You can post questions or other comments on the show notes themselves. This is a great way to practice and improve your legal English skills and to make sure any of the questions you have get answered. Go to our website, 4 is in the number 4, Legal English, no spaces or dashes, dot com, for legalenglish.com. You can check out our blog articles, available courses, in the show notes for this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast, give us five stars and a review. If you leave a great review, maybe we'll read it on air next time. So go ahead and leave an awesome review. The Four Legal English Podcast is adjourned. Don't miss the next docket call.